people of God are called into worship this morning from Psalm 24, verse 9. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory shall come in. Let us worship God. We're so glad today to welcome members of Glebe St. James, St. Giles Presbyterian and Southminster uh, Church. These are churches in the Glebe and in Ottawa South. And our traditional um, way during the summer is to come together in worship. And so these are the, the two weeks de designed um, for Fourth Avenue. And so we are really grateful to have those local communities join in this online service. Welcome. Um, it may be summer, but all of our churches continue to need your grace and generosity. And so as you think of your church on this beautiful summer day, we invite you to hear Romans 12 and 1. Now I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Let us pray. O Lord, you have sanctified us with your sacrifice, and we are glad. We choose to worship God of our salvation, yet it is impossible to worship without you present. If you do not come, our time is but an act or a charade performed for the benefit of one another. But if you are here, what we do is transformed into an altar of praise unto you. We yield who we are and what we bring to your service and ask you to have your way among us. Please hear us as we pray as we have been taught saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Gracious God, we come before your throne of compassion, grace, mercy, understanding, faithfulness, and steadfast love. Grateful you are God and we are creature. Forgive anything we have done that is not pleasing in your sight and renew the right spirit within us. Cleanse us, renew us, and make us completely yours. We continue to be amazed that God of earth and sky, maker, sustainer, and redeemer of the world would take any time at all with such disrespectful, disobedient, and disagreeable creatures. We often only think of ourselves, forgetting we live on one of the richest continents of the globe. We have fresh water to drink. We have access to safe and competent health professionals and more food to eat than 80% of the world's population. We are grateful to have this opportunity to beg your forgiveness for our shortcomings and for a chance to begin again with you the earth, and our neighbors. Thank you for all we have and enjoy from your hand and help us to be ever mindful of our many blessings. We join men, women, boys, and girls throughout the Christian world in worship today. Some may worship in secret, concerned if they are discovered they will be subject to persecution, even death. Others come together through online platforms, but no matter the location, the size of the gathering or the music shared, it is all done so you receive honor and glory. Triumphant King, as the world slowly returns to life as usual after months of isolation and confinement, 
We pray for every citizen, believing your presence be demonstrated and grace and wisdom will emerge throughout. Righteous Comforter, we have those within our fellowships whose lives have been disrupted by violence to their bodies. We remember them today asking for your healing balm and that it would be upon them. We remember especially our dear Christine David, who suffers greatly. We love them and we are glad you love them more and have had their days in mind before they had even one. We ask these blessings in the name of the one who remembers us always and who, and who is presently interceding on our behalf at the throne of God, our friend, our brother, and our savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture for today is taken from the great letter of the Apostle Paul to a church he desired to visit in Rome. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the spirit, because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. He also, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us 
from the love of Christ will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor real rulers nor things present nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I know it's a bright and sunny day here in the capital city of Ottawa, Canada. But it would be so naive to say that all is well. The big elephant in the room, the room, the reason we're online, the reason why even today here in the sanctuary, those who are participating are wearing face masks is COVID-19. Yes, businesses and communities have begun to open again, uh, but for a great 
number of our most vulnerable members of the community, it is still dicey to venture outdoors. On Friday, Ontario it reported 195 new cases, a mere 0.5% increase. And of course, that doesn't sound so bad until you hear the reality that 66% of those new cases were persons under 40. And a good number contracted the virus while attending large social gatherings of 15, 20, and even 25 people or more without physical distancing. This from Dr. Maloney, our top infectious disease physician. COVID-19 is in our community. The vast majority of us remain susceptible. For those unaffected, praise God from whom all blessings flow. But some have not only contracted the virus, but have suffered under its effects. Many cannot claim to have been directly affected, but indirectly have experienced the loneliness of isolation and the lack of physical contact with other human beings that the quarantine has mandated. Others have watched helplessly as family and friends died, unable to even attend the funeral service or to offer a hug. For a horrible over 30 days during April and May, every single day someone I know died of the coronavirus. Every single day. The worst was the day that I was notified of the death of two precious deacons, two saints of God who had served long side by side for over 40 years. They died in the same hospital, only rooms and days apart, but it might as well have been a million miles. After that, I prayed, I asked God for one day, one day that my timeline, my email, my text messages, my phone calls would not include a death from COVID-19. And God granted me one day. I needed one day. <laughs> if we're honest, if we're honest, even though the prognosticators have declared the effects of COVID-19 are waning, if we took an online poll, three out of five persons is either working from home, has not been to a restaurant to eat, nor has been called back to work from furlough. These facts could render us reluctant to hear and listen to a message of hope, preferring to be logical, reasonable, and what rational persons would agree are undesirable circumstances. My dear brothers and sisters, as the young people would say, don't get it twisted. Things are bad. And as Christians, we understand the struggle because we suffer with a certain amount of pain in the world. We are acutely aware and sensitive to that pain. We experience it in our lives and in our communities and with the people we are called to walk alongside. We read about the violence and brutality and famine that Christians suffer daily in our papers. We are living uh, um, in the exile of economic, political, and social realities that can strip us of our hope. Our current living conditions have left us weary, tired, and silent. Our confidence
confidences have been shattered, we are drained of our sense of expectation and we may even question the presence of God. All of this may be a normal reaction for Christians to assume since God is in control of everything that these are signs of God's rejection. This is not the conclusion we should draw. Life is hard, struggle is real, and there is always not an obvious way out. But this is not a reason to give up, to stop trying, or to stop believing. The portrait of an experienced follower of Christ is one of tears, of triumph, and cries of celebration. When our lives and our circumstances are in shambles and there is little reason to hope, the more we know about God helps. Knowing God helps. The people of Zaire have a problem. No matter how long the night, the day is sure to come. Maya Angelou has a poem. I know why the cage bird sings. The cage bird sings with a fearful thrill of things unknown but long for still. And his tune is heard on a distant hill for the cage bird sings of freedom. Lawrence Hill has a book. Amiato Diallo confesses, I have seen trouble dying. By all rights, I should not have lived this long. The Apostle Paul has a letter. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Saints, when the Apostle Paul says, what then can we make of all this? It is more than a summation of the previous three or four verses. It is a setup to hear the conclusion we are to draw from the whole of chapter 8, which is the certainty, the assurance of God's grace. We shall be patient purposeful, persistent, working for the kingdom. The apostle is providing an antidote, a remedy, an assurance that despite suffering and affliction, God has not abandoned us. We know God <laughs> and knowing helps. You know, it's a lesson I learned. It was seared into me in seminary. One of the most difficult courses that you take at Princeton Seminary is New Testament Survey. The course material is, of course, wonderful and engaging. It's the exams. Ooh, the exams are a nightmare. And on the midterm, we were asked to name Pilate's grandmother. <laughs> you can only imagine. It did not go well. Many failed and most didn't fare much better than failure. At the same time, in our small groups, we were studying Romans 31, 31, 8, Romans 8, 31 to 39. And it's the first time that I realized that it was said as a question. I told the group that historically in the black church it is said as a statement declaring boldly in the face of persecution our protection by God. The lead professor was sitting in the back of the room and snickered at my statement. I turned around and asked not politely either what in the world he found funny. And before he could answer, I declared with the text that even the most recent midterm exam did not reflect who I was in Christ Jesus. That this exam was with other injustices, persecutions, and hardships already placed on 
under submission of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, a long, long story made short and after several heated discourses, by the time it was all over, the professor, who also happened to be the head of the department, agreed not to hold our midterm grades against us and to allow our papers and our final exam grade to take precedent. Hallelujah. Knowing helps. The other much smaller elephant in the room here in Canada and the world is the continued effects of racism on life and culture. At Dalhousie University, Order of Canada recipient Dr. Wanda Thomas Bernard presented research on racism in Canada stating, that sense of helplessness creeps into our souls. Racism is killing us softly. But Dr. Bernard did not stop there. She also said that there needs to be critical hope, hopeful action that is based on the critical analysis of a situation. We need to lead the change. I want to change yesterday, not 10 years from now. Yes, things are bad. Bad things happen. When the apostle Paul writes for us, the Paul means for our sakes, for our benefits, not in our place. Evil does exist. We know evil exists. We are not denying the presence of evil. We are resisting it. We are declaring the superabundance of God's care and that that care is enough to cover all dangers. Evil is the past and there ain't no future in it. The Apostle Paul is asking not to allow even the fear of death to pit us against one another. God's love demonstrated in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ is enough with some to spare. We have work to do for the kingdom and nothing created can keep us from that destiny. The destiny God has planned for us. Time and space and other created powers can slow our progress, stall our forward movement, but they cannot affect God's final destiny for us. We know God and knowing helps. The apostle is offering true comfort to Christians. No charge can be brought against God's elect. This is predestination with a promise. Nothing can separate us from God's love. We are people with a destiny. This powerful passage gives way to the Apostle Paul's appeal for sympathy for the people of Israel. Jewish rights had been harshly restricted by Rome and many were being savagely treated in Roman Palestine. Paul was appealing to the church to have mercy on them and assist where they could. The same is true today. Despite the quarantine, you have been sharing in worship praying and reading your scripture. You have not stopped praying. You have not stopped calling on your neighbor or offering an encouraging word to those who needed it. God has poured into your soul's knowledge and insight and judgment. God is all powerful and all knowing. Therefore, all wisdom has as its source God. What you know and what you know about God has made a difference. My brothers and sisters, we may not know when, 
we're going to return to anything like normal. We may not know how that new reality will present itself, but we do know who will be there with us our very own personal groaner who gives the lament of our hearts to the one who made the promise. We do not need to worry. We do not need to despair, but remain certain and steadfast. The only ones who have the power to condemn us are the very ones who will protect us God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son. So let's look at what we do know. We know that God is the maker of all things and the provider of our well-being. God cares for us. We know that God exercises control over earthly affairs indirectly through contingencies of human purpose and nature. And when required by exercising direct causality in the form of miracles. As creator, God cares about the creator created by influence, by lure, and by persuasion, not by manipulation and control. We cannot allow this classic thinking to unravel under the weight of natural sciences and historical consequences. Bad things happen, and there may not be anything we can do about it, and through it all, God continues to be directly involved in history. God is not a disinterested and disengaged bystander who started humanity on its way and now waits for the final outcome. Oh no, God is interested in maintaining a connection between human history and the salvation story. Providence, God's caregiving, is experienced by us as individuals when we are empowered to go on, even after disappointments, humiliating defeats, and physical suffering. We will not be afraid. We will not cower in fear. We will not die. We will live. We will disagree without violence and anger. We will challenge the tendency to go back instead of marching forward. The difficulty of our circumstances may have exhausted us physically and made us nervous, yet we know that what God has done and because of what we know about God's past actions, our doubt in God's future actions shall not be reduced. God's providence is like that. It's what lures each of us away from hurt into health, from hard knocks into hallelujahs, and from heartaches into Herculean feats of justice and righteousness. In coming as Jesus did and doing everything that God asked and required, it opened a way that cannot be closed. Through Jesus Christ, all who believe are enlivened by the Spirit of God and find a connection between the historical and divine. Death is sin and life eternal. We need not harbor any doubt, for the way is no longer hidden. Walk away from any doubt you have that the circumstances of this world the nation, even your own life may be presenting and allow God to make your weakness your strength, your faintness power. Because in the end, it's all about knowing who God is. And the more we know about God, we know God helps and it Go into the world with this blessing. Knowing God helps. But you don't have to know as much as you think. 
Take the little, the medium, the lot that you know about God. Take that one verse that you memorize and add to that verse daily. And take what you know and build upon it and God will build on what you know. And God will encourage you and bless you and keep you and strengthen you and give you power. Take that strength, that peace, and that power out into the world and make a difference. Amen. Thank you.